You are listening to Grammy's Rocket Chair on RLM Radio. The girl of your dreams has got to be in some bar. Sorry, boys and girls, but this is X-rated. So if you're under 18... Get out, goddammit! Get the point. Good. And now... Bend over. Y'all ready for this? We do it all night long. And now, your host, Grammy. Hey there, hi there, ho there, everybody. And guess what? It is a Freaker Friday, and you are listening to Grammy's Rocket Chair here on RealLibertyMedia.com, Channel 10. Also on the RLM Spreaker Channel, the RLM TuneIn Radio Station, the RLM Internet Radio Station, and the RLM Radio.xyz site, and probably a few other places, but it's also going to be later on the RLM YouTube, RLM BitChute, and... and I heart radio, <laughs> I think. Heck, I don't know. I have mature blonde hair, so give me a break here. And besides, you know, I've been dealing with magic spells all day today, which is hence the what I started out with. Um, and what I mean by magic spells is, you know, whenever you speak, you're casting spells, whether you actually know it or not. But yeah. Your words have power, so use them wisely. You must control what you say and your intent as well. Okay, first let's say hey to some people. Over here on Twitter, thank you, Barman, for letting everybody know over here that I am live and in poison. And thank you, Grim, because I know you're the brains behind the operation. <laughs> let's see, and where else do I have? Um, oh, and hi there, Hope, and thank you. Welcome aboard, sweetheart. For thank you for following. I um I was starting to lose followers. It's like I turned some corners too fast or something. I don't know, but man, they were dropping like flies. And now I finally gained a couple back. So Lord only knows what's going on. It's Twitter. I get shadow banned a lot over there. Or that's my story, and I'm gonna stick to it. Okay, so over here on Minds, thank you once again, Barman and the Real Liberty Media page for letting everybody know that I am live and in poison. Over here on RealLiberty.org, I see Rob Works and Grimner and Bob Renner, and thank you, Grimner, again for letting everybody over here know that I am live and in poison. And the lovely Miss Mary B. Hi, Mary B. How are you doing, sweet? Oh, yes. She liked my post about Anastasia, the wisdom of a Siberian woman. Yes, I'm going to be discussing that this evening. Normally, I just kind of let, you know, stream of consciousness go when I'm doing this. But I just had entirely too many things in the last few days that kept directing me right back to this. And I thought, okay, okay. Here we go. And when I decided to, all right, here we go. Holy crap, Anoli, did I have all kind of things just, I was having synchronicities like crazy. So there you go. But, um, and I will be sharing that video in my podcast later as well. So, because I got a few things I want to read to you and a few things I wish to ponder with you as well. But before we get there, how about over here on this effing site, the wonderful Freedoms Network. Thank you, Grim, over here for letting everybody know that I am live and in poison. I also see that uh, uh, Bob Renner was over here for a while as well as Chris of the Chris of the Family Masters and Cowboy Tech as well as Grimner and the lovely Miss Estrella, who is always posting all kinds of brain food, and she's always quoting the Bible. And wow, thank you, hon. Um, you know, not that not uh, the Bible can be so many things, and once again, that is that spell casting thing. And you know, books books have binding. You ever thought about that? Kind of like spell binding. Hmm, you know, words, words, words. You can do all kinds of crazy stuff with words. Yes, you can. So I've been to Effin site. I've been to Minds. I've been to Twitter. Haven't been to Facebook, but over here on Facebook, thank you, lovely Mary B, over here as well. And hi, Darwin. 
and uh, oh, Jerka. Hi, Jerry. How are you doing, sweetheart, over there in Ireland? Jerry is my dear sister Catherine's companion. They are such a cute couple. So, okay. Oh, and Raymond is also here. Hi, Raymond. So, this is something that my brother Dammy Balls, <laughs> everybody's got a nickname in my family. This is something that he posted and I just had to share it. A father said to his son, be careful where you walk. And the son responded, you be careful. I walk in your footsteps. So please be mind mindful that children may not listen but they do imitate. So be mindful of that example that you are setting for them. Just putting that out there. Okay, now over here to the place where you need to be if you want to give me static. And by the way, if you are listening in on the Spreaker channel, my internet ain't the greatest, so come on over to reallibertymedia.com. Think of a nickname, join the chat, give me some static, and I'll give it back. So, over here in the RLM, hi, Alan, oh, brother-in-law, Alan, all righty. So, over here in the RLM, ooh, mojo for the chicken. I saw what you were doing to uh, that chicken, free enslaved, sounds yummy. Okay, over here in the RLM, right up top, I see Barman, the most splendiferous bot in the whole wide world, closely followed by Grimner, who is the RLM god, don't you know? I also see the lovely Moose Coil is logged in. Now, is she festing this weekend, or is she going to be around so you guys can have the Freakers Ball this evening? Inquiring minds want to know. I also see Backward Bracket DC is here, as well as Anti and Asmodeus Asmo. Free Enslaved is here, and he is cooking some chicken tonight. Looks like chicken tonight, dude. I'm here as well, and you know what? Tonight, I'm having brats and sauerkraut. Mm-mm-mm. -mm. I also see IB Don C is here as well as Java 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 Doctor 2. Meister Brower is also in the chat as well as the lovely Miss Kate down in Florida. Rob Oikes is here and I see he fired up the bubbler. Dude, you the man. Trust no one is also here. And yes, trust no one. <laughs> and maybe even don't trust yourself because there are times when you can be fooled. We'll get into that here in just a little bit, too. The lovely Miss Vanna White, the letter turner bot of the chit chat, as well as Weather Dork, who is the dork that gives you the weather. <laughs> Grim, we don't want to know. We don't want to know what he's doing with that chicken. Um, I also see Woodman. Hey, Woody, how you doing? As well as the lovely Z Beth Z and Phantom. Hi, Phantom. How you doing, sweetheart? Beetle! Hi, Beetle. Um, holy mackinoli. Um, Beetle's chit-chatting in the chit-chat as well. I also see Cyborg Noodle, and seeing as how it is a Friday, which is a Pastafarian holy day, may you be touched by his cyborgian noodliness. There you go. Um, Moose is at the Hippies in the Woods gathering. Oh, Hippies in the woods. Well, <laughs> you know them hippies were right. It's all about vibration, dude. Okay, I also see, so it'll be balls to the wall tonight. I'm going to ass yum. I also see Frumpt is here as well as Frumpy. Wow, it makes it rather difficult for me to try and figure out who in the hell I'm chit-chatting with, Frumpt Frumpy. Although Frump Frumpy count, sounds kind of fun too. And looky there, we got some Gooberzilla going on. Hey, Goober, and we got a Gromit in the chat, and uh, JJ's, no, 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 JJ's from over there in Scotland. Got a double kiss going on, too. Mwah, mwah. Mm, baby, didn't give you no tongue. <laughs> also have some pompa pompa pond sauce, and looky there, Cowboy Tech just joined. Hey, Cowboy, diddy up do Cowboy. And looky there, got a sock puppet in the chat as well. And to round out the crew, the one, the only, the Smatas. Uh, yes, noodliness. <laughs> 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 uh, 
Okay. Well, let's see. Where do I want to start? How about I start at the beginning? In the beginning, there was nothing. And then something happened, and now there's something. <laughs> That's about as far as I've gotten with my... Actually, I have all kinds of ideas running through my head, but... Uh, hootie doody whaty? Oh, babies. Hi, Borg Noodle. Hoo-ha. <laughs> <laughs> Sounds like way too much fun. Okay. Now, those of you that are res regular listeners, you know that I have been reading the Ringing Cedars series, and that is a bunch of books that uh, have been translated into English from Russian. Um, <laughs> oh, yeah, I know, Free and Slate, this sloppy. <laughs> sharing the love, hun, sharing the love. So, um, in any case... I've been, I've had a few people that have asked me, do they have these books on audiobook yet? Because, you know, they really don't have time to sit down and read, which me and my sit down and read time is kind of sketchy as well. So I usually do a little bit of reading just before I go to bed at night, and which means I fall asleep with the book quite a bit. And yes, I do actual books, actual books. Because, um, well, the tablet hurts my nose when I fall asleep and it lands on my nose. That's number one. And, you know, there's just something very primal about turning a page. Very primal. But there, were, it was quite, you know, this pretty much started, I believe, in 93 or 94 is when Vladimir Migre, or Migre, um, who is the author of these books, when he first met up with Anastasia in the Siberian tundra, if, well, not tundra, in the primal forests up in the Siberian area. And um, she pretty much told him that she wanted him to write books about her teachings. And she also told him that she is not a god or a goddess or what anyone should consider a wise woman or anything like that because she as she puts it she is what all of us are capable of being so having said that I went to uh, the Ringing Cedars site and uh, you know where you can order the books you can read a little clip um, of what each book is about and there are nine in total so far I don't know if Vladimir is writing anymore or not um, but I kept getting sent back to the translators preface which uh, apparently there was an original English translation but it was not done very well because it translated the words um, but not necessarily the real meaning, and the gal that did the translation was a little on the sketchy side when it came to English. So, um, the young man that of the video that I had shared earlier um, had uh, been given the book, the original book, the Ringing Cedar or Anastasia, he was given that book by his mother and promptly forgot about it. And then later, when his wife brought it to him, along with the next two in the series, <laughs> he really had no choice in reading it because, well, you know, you don't have to live with your mom, but with your wife, eh, to keep peace in the family. <laughs> Just saying. So, this is something that all rights are reserved, but you can read it online and download it to your personal computer, print it, distribute it free of charge, hard copies, whatever. So, it is kosher for me to read this, just so you know. Now, the translator of this was uh, John Woodsworth and Dr. Leonid Shraskin was the editor, and he is he's the young man that his mother gave him the book bless his heart and I'm so thankful that she did um, they started this process in the early 2000s let's see 2005 I guess okay copyright of the books was 1996 by Vladimir Migre but um, 
the the copyright of the translations started in 2005 and then 2008 they redid a few things to add a few little add a few details add a few details but this is the translator's preface and every everything in this site kept telling me read the translator's preface so here we go and that's why I'm going to take longer than an hour tonight because I'm going to read this and then I got all kind of goodies that I want to discuss with you or at least seed your brain with. How about we put it that way? So, <clears throat> when I opened my online Slavic languages bulletin one day in early September 2004, I first learned about the books of the Ringing Cedar series that was seeking a translator into English. Little did I realize the kind of literary adventure that was awaiting me. But as I became acquainted with the details of Vladimir Migre's fascinating work, he read the first three books in the series uh, for before beginning in the actual translation. Now this is this um, translator, John Wordsworth, is Canadian, and he does an awful lot of Russian translations. So to carry on with this. Um, see okay it gradually dawned on him that much of his previous translation experience especially in poetry and poetic prose uh, stories of contemporary Russian writers uh, not to mention his own religious background emphasizing man with a capital M unique status as the image and likeness of the Creator had been preparing me specifically for this particular task Migre's work was simply the next logical step. It seemed in the progression of my career. Indeed, I found myself taking to it not only with the enthusiasm that comes with the prospect of facing a new professional challenge, but even more with the thought of feeling very much at home in this new literary environment. Now, some of my friends and colleagues have asked, what kind of book are you translating? No doubt wondering whether they could look forward to reading a novel, a documentary account, an inspirational ex exigent... Okay, I have no idea what that word is, and I'm not even going to butcher it. <laughs> um, an inspirational something on the meaning of life, or even a volume of poetry. But... Even after completing the translation of Anastasia, I still did, do not have a definitive answer to give them. In fact, I'm still asking myself the same question. So, Book 1, Anastasia. My initial response was a rather crude summary of a gut impression, and I would tell them. Think of Star Trek meets the Bible. My feelings about the book, however, go far beyond this primitive attempt at jocularity. Of the four disparate genres mentioned above, I would have to say that Anastasia has elements of all four and then some. First, the book reads like a novel. That is to say, it tells a first-person story in a most entertaining way, bringing out the multifaceted character of both the author and the title personage in a matter not unlike what readers of novels might expect. It tells a tale of adventure in a raw Siberian wild where even sex and violence make an occasional appearance, though with a connection to the plotline quite unlike their counterparts in any work of fiction that I have read. Secondly, the book gives the impression of a documentary account of real-life events even if one's powers of belief are sometimes stretched to the limit, which I got to put here real quick, there were quite a few times where I went, are you kidding me? Seriously? And so then I'd have to go and do some research and then I'd go back to reading again. <laughs> so yeah, sometimes your belief systems get stretched to the limit. Now, I am glad that my linguistic experience has given me access not only to the book itself, but also to a host of Russian language texts on the internet that have enabled me to corroborate from independent sources 
a great many of the specifics the author saw fit to include in his narrative, such as names of individuals, institutions, scientific phenomena, and all of which turned out to be genuine, thereby contributing an additional measure of credence to what otherwise might seem utterly fantastic. Much of the corrobor corroborative information so gleaned I have attempted to pass on to the English-speaking reader in the footnotes with the help of additional commentary by the editor. And yet there is a significant area of the author's description where authenticity must still be judged by the individual reader, which to me is one of the hallmarks of a work, work of literature in contrast to merely academic or journalistic report. Now thirdly, the book penetrates one's thinking and feelings with the gentle voice of, force of a divinely inspired treatise. A treatise on not only the meaning of human life, but much more. Anastasia offers a tremendous new insight into the world interrelationship of God, man, nature, and the universe. I would even go so far as to call it a revelation in science and religion. One nutshell description that comes to mind is a chronicle of ideas. Ideas on a the history of humanity's relationship to everything outside itself, b the clouds, not only dark and foreboding, but even the fluffy and attractive variety, or, and of mistaken belief that have over the years hidden this relationship from our sight and comprehension, and c where to begin. Once, it, once we have caught a glimpse of this relationship, the necessary journey to reclaim the whole picture. Deeply metaphysical in essence, the Chronicle is set forth with both the supporting evidence of a documentary account and the entertainment capacity of a novel. In other words, it can be read as any of these three in isolation. But only by taking the three dimensions together will the reader have something approaching the complete picture of the book. And all three are infused with a degree of soul-felt inspiration that can only be expressed in poetry. Indeed, one must not overlook the poetry. As a matter of fact, I learned right at the start that experience in poetic translation was one of the qualifications required of the Ringing Cedars series translator. And not just on account of the seven sample poems by readers at the end of chapter 30, much of the book's prose, especially when Anastasia is speaking, exudes a poetic feel with rhyme and meter running a background course through the whole paragraph at a time. Hence a particular challenge lay in reproducing this poetic quality along with the semantic meaning in English translation. Such poetic prose is even more evident in subsequent books in the series. Now another challenge has been to match as closely as possible Vladimir Migre's progressive development as a writer. According to his own admission, Migre be, uh, began this whole literary project not as a professional writer, but as a hardened entrepreneur for whom writing was the farthest activity from his mind. I smiled when one of the test readers of the translation, after finishing the first few chapters, described the author's style as choppy, which it is in the first book. It's pretty rough in the first book. Migre himself talks about the initial rejection notices that he received from publisher after publisher, telling him his language was too stilted. And yet his rendering of some of Anastasia's pronouncements towards the end of the book um, waxes quite lyrical indeed, especially in the poetic passages referred to above. The author's development in literary style, which he attributes to Anastasia's direct and indirect guidance, becomes even more pronounced as the series progresses. 
It will be up to the English-speaking reader to judge whether this translation is also conveyed or transformation, excuse me, is also conveyed in the trans, uh, translation. Now there are two Russian words of frequent occurrence throughout the book that presented a particular translation challenge. And part of this, I'm just going to interject this real quick, part of this is because the Russian language, if you really do some digging and researching and history on it, is as old as Sanskrit. It is a very, very ancient language. And it is a language of the heart, which does not translate too well into English. So to carry on with this, one of them was Dachnik, or the, which is the plural of Dachnik. And this is referring to people who own a dacha, or a country cottage, situated on just 600 square meters of land, obtain, obtainable free of charge from the Russian government. But there's a little comparison here to most Western concepts of cottagers. While Russian dachas may be found in forested areas or simply on open farmland, one almost invariably feature is a plot on which are grown fruits and vegetables su to supply the family not only for their dacha stays, but right through the year. Given that the word dacha is also known to many English speakers and is included in popular editions of both Oxford and Webster dictionaries, it was decided to use the Russian word designating its occupants as well, with the English plural ending of Dachniks, which is those that live in the Dachas. Now the question that entailed the most serious difficulty, however, one that formed the subject of dozens of emails between editor and translator before it was finally resolved, was the rendering into English the word of Shalov, Shal, uh, Shalovik. There you go, Shalovik. It's a common term used to denote a human being of either gender and the equivalent of German mensch, as well as English man, in the similar Bible verse, God created man in his own image. And um, let's see, I have a little note here. I've been, I was writing notes like crazy today, trying to get all of this um, written down to where I could keep it all kind of straight. But um, a dacha is basically a garden. So, and um, there is a difference between, because, okay, he'll, he'll go into the description. Yes, my dear. Yes, I am not, yeah, I'm getting all edumacated and stuff. So, but you guys need this. You need this in order to understand where I'm going to go next, okay? <laughs> So, <laughs> I need to get this in here. Okay, so the problem with um, the term human, as in human beings, is that it not only suggests a formation of species from matter or earth, such as compare humus, which is the organic constituent of soil, but is associated with lowly concepts from hummus, come words like humble and humility. And besides, the word human is essentially an adjective, not a noun even though commonly used as a noun in today's English. On the other hand, Chelevek is derived from two old Russian words indicating mind or thinking, which is cello, and eternity or time, vek. And interestingly, interestingly enough, the English word man has a similar derivation. In this case, from the Proto-Indo-European root men, signifying mind, thinking, or intelligence. And it was not until approximately the 11th century CE that the word man in Germanic languages became narrowed down in focus to denote primarily the adult male. Now, this is key here. This is key in the whole spell binding and casting spells, okay? Because man went, man with a capital M went from being all of us humans, a, a divine creature, if you will, to man with a lowercase m, just meaning adult male. 
things got morphed, things got perverted, if you will, and not in the pervy kind of sex pervy shit, although that's happened too. But words morph and get perverted, and I'm I'm to the point now where I'm thinking this is not just a gradual progression kind of thing. This is an intentional thing. Okay, so to carry on with this, by the late 13th century, had it had all but squeezed out the earlier term for male, which is were, or the Latin vir, um, and that's echoed in modern words like virile. So, on the basis of Anastasia's sayings, as presented by the author in the whole series, it may be seen that the constriction of overall human thought has been reflected in a narrowing of the meaning of man with the lowercase m, which originally, like Russian chalavik and German mensch, even today, designated all humanity, both men and women, as thinking, intelligent beings. Now, at one point, realizing that some readers would take exception to the use of man, especially these days with all the gender bender nonsense out there, on the grounds that, you know, in today's usage at least, it excludes half of the population, basically, we contemplated using the word chelavek in translation for this purpose. However, we decided this alternative was outweighed by, number one, a feeling of exclusion um, many readers would experience by being described by a foreign word, because, you know, people get triggered so easily, and um, the opportunity to rediscover the original meaning of an English word whose usage has been constricted and corrupted over the past 10 centuries. Now, it is interesting to note that from the 11th to the 19th centuries in Russia, the word Chelevek itself suffered the same fate as the English word man, largely confined to designating male human beings, often male servants or slaves in particular, which really male human beings, servants, slaves, there's really not much difference, is there? Now, it was only in the 20th century, do what? Had to go on mute. Oh, okay. Where was I? Do what? Do what? Yay! All righty. That's awesome and well then. And welcome aboard, honey. I'm doing Anastasia and the Ringing Cedars stuff. So, okay. Back to where was I at? Da, 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 da. Okay, there it was. Okay. It was only in the 20th century that the original universal sense made its comeback of sorts among the population at large to refer to, in most contexts at least, both men and women equally. Now that's the word chelavek in Russian. And this offers hope that in time its English counterpart man, with the lowercase m, may meet with a similar restoration of its original sense. Now I'm thinking this explosion of gender bender pronoun identifying nonsense that's going on is going on precisely because there has the Ringing Cedars books are making so much headway globally. Seriously, give that a little thought here, especially if you've if you haven't read any of these, at least watch the video that I've posted and I will post it again later on, but you need to watch that video. Lots of historical data in there. And, uh, yeah, it's amazing. It's amazing how we've been lied to or things have been subverted or perverted or upside down or however you wish to put it. Now, back to this. Hence, it was decided to translate Chelevek or wherever appropriate in the context to the term man with a capital M, not only in an effort to retain the association of the term with a divine, as opposed to a material earthly origin, but also to draw upon the original uncorrupted meaning of the word man as a manifestation of eternal mind. 
implied in the entomology of the Russian term shelovek. So let all readers of this book be put on notice. Wherever you see man with a capital M, this includes you. Now there are other discrepancies between Russian and English concepts behind respective translation equivalents. But their explanation is best left to individual footnotes, which he left those. There's lots of footnotes in those books. Lots of them. Now in conclusion, I must express my gratitude to my editor, Leonid Shiroshkin, first for entrusting me with the privileged task of translating such a monumental work as the Ringing Cedar series, and secondly for the tremendous support he has given me throughout this initial project, namely in illuminating aspects of Vladimir Migre's and Anastasia's concepts of God, man, nature, and the universe that my previous experience with Russian literature could not possibly have prepared me for. These shared insights have made a significant difference in how particular nuances of the originals are rendered in the translation, and especially in making allowances for the considerable geographical, social, and philosophical distances that all too often separate English-speaking readers from the vast cultural treasures accessible to those with the knowledge of Russian. So, uh, yes. Oh, sweetheart, <laughs> you can say it was the Jews, but according to some of the stuff I have looked up, it was Christianity. The And it could be, I don't know, but it was Christianity that did an awful lot. Because a, a, a thousand years ago when the Christian princes invaded Russia and started taking stuff off, you know, taking things over, and you know, I've been seeing an awful lot of thousand years mentionings. You know, it's that's almost becoming as um, popular a time frame as the six million people killed thing that's out there, whether it's Jews or Russians or Chinese or what have you. Six million apparently is a very popular number and a thousand years apparently is a popular number and it really hit home when I was playing um, that Queen song before I, I started and his reign has run a thousand years and it's like, oh my lord. Actually, and well then, this these books were self-published. Vladimir Migre had to publish them himself because none of the Russian publishers would take it. So he had to publish them themselves. And in the publishing process, he usually sold just enough books to pay for the next round of publishing. So the man did not make a whole lot of money until after all of the books had been written. And now he's starting to make. And yes, Russia is huge. Huge. So, um, one of the best ways to hide the truth is to put it right in front of you, but pervert its meaning. That's one of the things that I've gotten from these books. Now I'm going to read you a little excerpt from book six, which is the book that I'm on right now. The Book of Kin, book six of the Ringing Cedar series. In chapter five, the history of mankind as told by Anastasia. People have been living on the earth for billions of years. Everything on the earth was created perfect right from the start. Trees, blades of grass, beetles, and whole animal world. There is a direct connection between everything living on the earth and the entire universe. The apex of creation is man with a capital M. And in the great pristine harmony of all things man was created harmonious. Man does not rule over nature. Man is part of nature. Now man's purpose is to learn about all of his surroundings and create perfection in the universe. 
to create the likeness of the world of the earth in other galaxies and with each new creation of his to add more splendor to earthly creations. The way will open for man to create on other planets when man is able to overcome temptation, when man is able to hold in unity the grand and diverse energies of the universe inherent in him, and when he does not allow one of them to take precedence over the other. The day when the whole earth is a paradise garden will mark the opening of the path of the creation of the universe. And once man becomes aware of the whole harmony of the earth, he will be able to contribute his own splendor. Man takes upon himself to take account of his actions once in every million years. Whenever he makes a mistake, whenever he allows one of the many diverse energies that he contains to dominate at the expense of the rest, a global catastrophe takes place. Then everything starts again from the beginning. This has happened many times. One of mankind's million year periods may be divided into three ages. First, the Vedic age, second the age of image and third the age of the occult the first age of human society on the earth the vedic lasts 990,000 years during this age man lives in paradise with a gladsome child maturing under parental care during the vedic age god is known to man all god's feelings are inherent in man and through them man is able to obtain any advice he needs directly from God and if man should suddenly make a mistake God is free to correct it simply by giving a hint without disturbing the general harmony or infringing on man's freedom in any way in the Vedic age man does not raise questions about how or by whom the world the universe the galaxies along with his marvelous planet called earth were created everyone is completely aware that everything around either visible or invisible has been created by their father namely God their father their mother whatever it is a asexual creature it's referred to as father in this the father is everywhere all that grows and lives are his living thoughts his program provided one first understands it in detail during the Vedic age man did not bow down before God nor was there a multitude of religions which sprang up afterward there was a culture of to life. People lived in divine way of life. There were no diseases of the flesh. Feeding and clothing himself in a divine manner, man simply did not think about food or clothing. Thought was otherwise occupied with the excitement of discovery. And no rulers reigned over human society. There were no boundaries marking off states as today. Human society on the earth consisted of happily happy families. The various continents were inhabited by families. They were all united by their aspiration to create a space of splendor. There were many new discoveries and each family upon making a splendid discovery felt the need to share it with others. Open source. The original open source. Families were formed by the energy of love and everyone was fully aware that a new family would create one more oasis of splendor on the native planet. There were many rituals, holidays, and carnivals among the people of the Vedic age, each imbued with great meaning, sensitivity, and conscious awareness of the real divine existence on the earth. Earth rituals served as a grand school and grand experiment or examination for each man that took part in it an examination in the eyes of others in the eyes of oneself and consequently in the eyes of God 
I shall tell you about and show you one of the rituals. It was a red wedding rite. And she goes into quite a lengthy description of what the wedding rite is. I've read that. It's really quite fascinating. <clears throat> quite wonderful. Now, now, on to what I am learning from this. Because really, the best way to hide the truth, huh, sorry about that, Vinny. I'll see if I can, I can find a better link for you. Um, best way to hide the truth from people is to put it right in front of you. And when you co-create or when you're creating an existence, you um, cast spells. There you go, and well then. There you go. Excellent job. Excellent job. Yeah. Okay. Um... Tell you what, I'll show you this one too. And it's uh, this link has at the bottom of it the read the translator's preface. So, ah, oh, thank you, sock. This is about the translator itself. So, some of the things that I have been learning, um, you know, is about words and how they originally the intention the original meaning of the word and how it has been changed and the differences in mentality you know thought process and all that other fun stuff and um let's see apparently and this is from that um anastasia video that here we go i'll just go ahead and uh share that link for you oops nope let's do it like this there you go here's the link and this there you go just put some crust on it there you go um, in any case um Okay, so when they when they take the language or they take take a truth and they they pervert it. Now everybody, everybody in the Western world, or I would think an awful lot of people in the Western world know that Lucifer or Satan is supposed to be the light bringer. That's what Satan is supposed to mean. So, um, Lucifer is supposed to be the light bringer. Now this is all going to tie into. Russia as well because Russia has been called the great Satan for how long now and who was it Edgar Casey said something about there would be um, a spiritual awakening coming out of Russia that may be the savior of the world so I have the books and they are absolutely amazing so Russia the way that or what Russia means, the word itself, it means seeding the light. Now, they have been heavily, or at least since Christianity has been a big deal, we have had a devil. Because you really, in the other Aramaic religions, you know, like uh, Islam or Muslim, that is an Aramaic religion, and so is Judaism. They are Aramaic or Ara Abrahamic, there you go, Abrahamic religions, and so is Christianity. Now, <laughs> oh, that's funny, and well then, um, but um, ever since Christianity has kind of sort of made its, reared its ugly head, um, we have been given a, a devil, if you will, an evil and evil you know something that is just so bad but it's something else you know oh America can be the great Satan as well America can be the great Satan or Russia I keep hearing Russia is the great Satan I've heard that lots of times as well so Russia is actually means seeding the light 
and Lucifer is the light bringer. They also call Venus the light bringer. It's the first star that you see in the evening, just so as you know. Now, some of the other things that um, translate, which the way we look at them here in America and or in the English language is really very different from from what um, the Russian language sees it as. Um, like the word joy. The word joy here, you're feeling joy because of something that you were given. Whereas in Russia, joy means to give off light. So, um, or in Russian, I should say. Um, water. The Russian word for water is freedom giver. That's what it translates to in English. Um, in Russian, a dacha or a garden is to give. That's what it translates to. Whereas a farm here in America, farm, the Russian word for farm means to take. So see the, the whole, when you go with the ancient language, and this is, this is where I'm thinking, you know, a thousand years ago, lots of hinky stuff has been going on in the last thousand years. Lots of hinky stuff. And um, it was about a thousand years ago that the Christian princes arrived in Russia. And within 100 years of their arriving in Russia, there was drought, there was famine, there was the concept of ownership of land, because prior to that, those people had no concept of ownership of land. Those people had no concept of a government. It wasn't until the Christian princes came in and took things over that they, they got government introduced to them. And how did government get introduced to them? Well, they were pretty much told, well, we want to live in splendor and you guys are all our servants and all of this property either belongs to the church or it belongs to the government. And if you wish to be able to remain on that land, you are going to have to pay to us. You're going to have to pay us to buy that land and you're going to have to pay us taxes in kind, which basically means your crops. Yeah, things get really blurred up, Frumpy. Really blurred up. But you know, there's there's things like um, a kingdom. Did you know that a kingdom originally was a family homestead? That's the Russian translation of a kingdom. So you may read somewhere and they may translate it as um, this Russian kingdom over here. The Russian kingdom was a family homestead. The man was the king of his castle and the woman was the queen of the castle. Yeah, introduced is definitely shoved down their throat. Definitely. Definitely. So, um, let's see. There's a couple other things. Oh, another thing that I was from some of the other, I can't remember which book it was that I was reading about, but um, Anastasia said that um, she just does not understand the current culture's way of dealing with departed loved ones, if you will. Um, because the way, and, and in book six, early in book six, um, great grandfather, it is his time. He is getting ready to, um, shed his earthly skin, get rid of his meat suit, however you wish to look at it. So when in their culture, in the Vedic culture, which is the culture that was very, um, very much going on in Russia um, when uh, the princes showed up. But in the Vedic culture, what they do is they take you, you know, to your home 
to your your uh, land of kin, if you will, your your home place. And that's where you are allowed to pass and you are buried there by a tree or you're buried and a tree is put on top of you and allowed to grow. And so you have eternal life and your spirit carries on. Your spirit, your spirit is free to reincarnate and spirits in the Vedic belief or in the Vedic culture reincarnate into families. But here, here, we have funerals and we have graveyards and we put these people in sealed boxes and we put a marker where this person is dead and you're casting a spell there because when you go through that funeral process you are actually casting a spell and saying this person is dead this person is dead you're planting that seed in the minds of the family members and telling them this person is dead and what that does to this person that has died in the physical because energy does not die and we are all energy we are all consciousness energy does not die but what that does is it plants that seed it casts that spell on the living survivors and those fight those survivors enforce that spell by Bearing them in a sealed casket and putting a marker that puts the date that they were born and the date they died and they are dead. So, now they're stuck. They are considered dead. And yet, there is something about... Um, reincarnation that just plain cannot be cannot be dismissed or gotten rid of so one of the things that that I kinda sorta realized in the, all of this is they couldn't take away reincarnation when they brought this whole Abrahamic stuff in with the um, you know one God thing Although I do believe the God of this um, world is the devil. And seriously, when you look at all of the nasty stuff that's going on in this world, it's not hard to believe. It really isn't hard to believe. But since they couldn't take away reincarnation because energy does not die, because energy just transmutes, it just transforms, what they did was they cast a spell. And they had us reinforce it in our minds. And even those that have passed beyond because they have had it reinforced in their mind during their whole lifetime. So now, when the body dies, sure you reincarnate, but now you reincarnate as another energy slave. You are transformed. You, your memories get wiped. Originally, in reincarnation, that did not happen. You reincarnated into families. And do what? Yeah, language is the tool, Frumpt. It definitely is. We are all, man, are all eternal life. That's what that word means originally, eternal life. So, I just, I had to get this out here because it's like, man, there's been so much stuff that I've been seeing that's been just kind of pummeling on all of this and and another one of the things that when when the Russian Orthodox Inquisition which you know we've all heard about the uh, Spanish Inquisition um, but also you know like the uh, eradication basically or almost eradication of the indigenous people in uh, South America, the indigenous people in the United States or North America, the indigenous people in Australia. These are the people that had ancient, ancient cultures. These are people that had a, uh, a verbal history. 
you know, you had to have the inclination for that. You got specially chosen. You were like a, shum, a shaman of the tribe. You are the wise person of the tribe. And so they, a lot of them did not necessarily have a uh, written language. It was more of a verbal history and a pictorial history because pictures can tell so much more than words can. Pictures can express all kinds of things. They can conjure up all kinds of feelings. And so I think that a lot of that, that was the culling. That was during that time frame when there was an awful lot of culling going on. And I, I really do, this ties into the whole Tartaria thing as well. Because if you look back, a greater Tartaria was in Russia. You can look on the old maps and, I mean, just go and look. Um, Greater Tartaria was in Russia. So I think they really had to take that out first. They had to hit that first and they hit it with the Christian princes. And they started perverting the the uh, natural. And, and it's not really... Um, a religion per se it's a lifestyle it's a culture it's not even really a belief system because within every belief is a lie every belief b e l i e f so they took out those vedic people in russia first and then they spread out and they hit the americas and they hit Australia, all of these people that had ancient cultures, that had verbal history, that had wise men and wise men, women, that had shaman, all of this other fun stuff, you take out the people that are the history keepers and you can change history. You can rewrite it completely. And there are lots and lots of people checking into a lot of this stuff now. Yeah, that's true, Frumpt. The Tatari is undeniable. Yes, it is there. And we were not taught about it for a reason. They did not want us knowing about it. There is so much going on. So much going on. And and my brain has been, yes, I have been downloading an awful lot. And I'm sure I sound very all over the place. <laughs> but <laughs> it's like I have got sensory overload going on here. Um, the history of the Talmud is even, that that is a bastardization of the true history of man with a capital M. It truly is. The Talmud is not near as old as some of the oldest cultures. Not near as old. But, and most of that stuff is borrowed from like Sumerian texts. So, yeah, been an awful lot, awful lot going on. And it has been in the last thousand years. So, one of the things that might be a little bit helpful. You know, people think, wow, a thousand years is a long time, but really, is it? It's 40 generations, four zero, 40 generations. Now, you can change things within a couple of generations if you really, really want to. If your intent is to no longer go along with the current reality that you do not like, that you do not benefit from, and instead of fighting that reality because wherever you focus energy that gets your energy whether it's focusing energy to fight against it or focusing energy to support it it gets your energy so instead of instead of fighting the existing reality create one that makes it obsolete it's happening all over. It really is. There is a battle going on. And it is for your mind. And World War III, the 
the actual World War III is actually World War I, and it's been going on in your mind for thousands of years. It really has. So, I'm going to end this little thing. I will go to the pig. I didn't go that much over an hour. I really thought I would go longer, but man, I just kind of... In any case, end with this quick little quote that I got today from all places, Dr. John Bergman. <laughs> from a video that he put out in 2003, no less. And uh, he said, the stuff that you think you know may not be true. And you know, that's where we come back to, maybe it is true, but your understanding of it isn't. Because things get warped, things get perverted, things get topsy-turvied. They'll put that truth right there in front of you. Crime and Christmas, everybody knows all the different things that we have all seen in videos and movies and all that other fun stuff. And everybody says they have to put it in front of you. Yes, they do. They have to put the truth out there. But when they explain it, when they put it in context, it is a false explanation and a false context. Keep that in mind next time you see something and you stop and think, oh, that's bullshit. It's probably the truth. It's the context or the explanation that's bullshit. So now that I have done that, what is that sock puppet? Thank you, sweetheart. I am going to go and check out the pig real quick just to see what happened this date in his story. And remember, his story is written by those who have won so far. But you cannot... Okay, what is that? I think it's... Um, um, I can't remember who said it. Damn it. It was right there and now it's gone. In any case, there are three things that cannot remain hidden forever. The sun, the moon, and the truth. Those three things... It's been over a thousand years, but you know what? We're finding it. We're digging it out and we're not putting up with it anymore. Slowly but surely, people are waking up. And I know, don't call you Shirley. Okay, over here on PIGazette.com, let's always leave them laughing, have a little funny here. The word of the day is progtard. It's a backstabbing neo-Marxist American hating scumbagger who, who is determined to make you as miserable as they are. There are so many people out there that you really, 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 you need to stop and think before you start fighting them, before you, because seriously, you, when you get into a verbal tete-a-tete -tete with an idiot, you must be very, very careful because they will do everything in their power to drag you down to their level and then they will win with experience. Do not argue with a progtard. Do not argue with, seriously, don't argue with anyone. I mean, it, it really, is it worth your time? They're either going to argue until you get tired and then they're going to declare themselves a winner. Or you can just say, well, if it comforts you to think that way and then turn around and walk off. They may think they won until they think about it a minute. And then they'll get pissed. And that means you won. Think about that. In the quotable quotes section, we disapprove of state education. Then the socialists say that we are opposed to any education. We object to state religion. Then the socialists say that we want no religion at all. We object to a state-enforced equality. And they say that we are against equality. And so on and so on. It is as if socialists were to accuse us of not wanting persons to eat because we do not want the state to raise grain. That's from Frederick Batiste. Huh. Yeah, and uh, here's another thing to, since that grain came up, another thing to consider. You know, grain prices, especially when you account for inflation, grain prices are way worse than they were prior to the Department of Agriculture. Think about that. Everything the government 
touches goes to shit. Government is a perversion that is forced upon us all. We do not need it. And the only reason we still have it is because too many people have bought into the propaganda bullshit that you just cannot have safety and security and peace and live a fulfilling life without having some moron a thousand miles away pulling the strings, leaving edicts. Too many people have bought into that nonsense. Time to unlearn some of that nonsense. Now, this date in history, the 5th of July, 1810. A man with legendary powers of persuasion and an ability to put together compelling entertainment. P.T. Barnum is born. Dang, and there was a sucker born every minute ever since then. And lastly, this date in history, the 5th of July, 1946. A man whose greatness can't be overstated. Lewis Reard thrills horn dogs around the world uh, when his bikini swimsuit debuts in a Paris fashion show. The bikini. I don't have a problem with the bikini. I have a problem with the postage stamp thing. Mainly because people have been men, being the horn dogs that you are, you've got to embrace that. <laughs> Not saying it's a bad thing, but embrace it, hon. Um, you like seeing a little bit extra skin. Don't have a problem with that, but this three postage stamp stuff and rectal floss is bullshit. And this whole bikini wax and stuff is bullshit. And all of this, in my mind, was a long-range plan because these people turn the dial up on that jacuzzi, turning the heat up very, very gradually. And they make it seem like it's your idea. So the bikini debuts and everyone is aghast. Oh my God, we see belly buttons. Ah! And yet, and yet, it gets skimpier and skimpier and skimpier. And then women are told, oh, you must shave that bikini area. You must wax that bikini area. And it gets skimpier and it gets skimpier and it gets skimpier. And the bikini wax gets more and more and more until bada bing, bada boom, you've got women going around looking prepubescent. Think about that. So you like your women prepubescent, eh? Think about it. It's a messed up world, but they make you think it's your idea. That's how they get away with it. Oh well, y'all been listening to Grammy's Rocket Chair here on RealLibertyMedia.com, channel 10. I have kind of gone off on a tangent, but there's just lots of stuff here that just... <laughs> It's all been hitting at once, and I had to vent. I had to vent. I had to get it out of the system. Release them evil spirits. So, thank you, Frompt. Um, let's see. Later on, it will be balls to the wall. Am I correct, Grimner? Later on this evening here on reallibertymedia.com. Also, tomorrow at noon Eastern Time, we're going to have some flash rooney dork with um, the dork table. And if I can swing it, I may try and show up for at least a little bit of that. Got to see if I can swing it. Depends on the weather and if I, how soon I go over to paint at my uncle's. Also, Sunday at noon Eastern Time, Grimner is going to be hopping on the radio again for some blues for y'all. And... Uh, Probably a rousing game of trivia going on in the chat as well. Then, directly following Grimner, we're going to have some Hal Anthony who's going to open up a can of whoop-ass on yo ass behind the woodshed. And then Monday, we will have Grimner again at 7 p.m. Eastern Time with some leftovers. He's going to have some brain food that's probably going to be uh, more put together. <laughs> Then what? I kind of dished up some hash this n tonight. <laughs> Maybe more of a smorgasbord, you know? And all you can eat smorgasbord. There you go. And then it's Tuesday morning. 
at 2 a.m. We're going to have In a Playfect World with Flash Rooney Dork and possibly Benny. I will be back next week Wednesday, 7 p.m. Eastern Time for the Wackadoodle Wednesday edition of the Rocket Chair. God only knows, I may go off on another tangent. What do you think of them apples? But until then, I hope y'all have an absolutely amazing weekend. If I don't see you, I guess I'll catch you in the funny papers one way or t'other. But please remember, question everything. Be live nothing. And remember, I honestly do love you all. And I wish you all enough. Good night.